Hello. Hi there. Hey. How are you? Good. How are you? Not too bad. Thanks for joining us today, Luke. Yeah. Are we live right now? No. No. I'm just gonna let the people think that we're live right now. Okay. <laughs> it's the grand right. the grand illusion that I create here with the podcast. You know. What is uh, a guy like you up to at uh, I guess it's three o'clock your time on a Tuesday afternoon? Um, I actually um, just got back from uh, picking up some uh, some art supplies because I'm I'm doing a um, designing a T-shirt for my friends. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of the band Big Thief. Um, I just moved. I'm, I live in Cal. I live in Northern California now. I, I moved here about a year ago. So. But I knew them. I knew them from living in the city, and we would play shows together. And they came on. Um, they did their. Uh, I think th- they came on tour with Here We Go Magic last year, and, and I think it was their first. It was their first uh, full national tour that we brought them on. And since then, they've kind of like ballooned. They're doing really well now. Okay, I know. I Us. remember now because your name came up in the same interview. You know, Sam. <laughs> Sam Owen. Sam Owen, also known as Sam Evian now, of course. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. And uh, that's, he, he was talking about Big Thief. And then at some point, your name and your connection to uh, Sam came up in that interview as well. So, small world, man. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Why the uh, move to, uh, to LA? Um, I'm not living in LA, actually. I live in, um, in, in a town called Point Reyes Station. I think there's probably, I think there's a, like probably 400 people in the town. Oh, wow. It's it's uh it's in West Marin, which is um, on the coast, uh, about an hour an hour north of San Francisco. Um, it's a it's it's a um, it's a uh, it's a national there, there's national and state park all around. So it's kind of like living in a in a in a state park. But I moved here I moved here because I my girlfriend lives here and we, I had a long distance relationship with her for about a year hmm. and one of what well, either she was going to come to New York or I was going to come out here and it seemed vastly more interesting having been in New York for 17 years to um to come out here was there a bit of a culture shock for you as soon as you got out there or, what, or did it seem immediately comfortable to you um well um, it pretty immediately comfortable um and refreshing because I, you know, it was in contrast to having been in the city for so long, and and I, it um. It tapped into something that that's kind of familiar because I grew up in a in a very bucolic little seaside village mm-hmm. in Massachusetts, kind of analogous, kind of analogous to this place, except it of the New England version. <laughs> um, so so it's familiar, like on a on a on a very deep level, probably more familiar than an urban environment, you you know, because it's where I grew, I grew up in a place like this. So, um, familiar and, uh, and then also refreshing. And then I think, uh, just, it took, um, feeling kind of any, uh, culture shock actually, uh, has, hasn't arrived till relatively recently. (laughs) It's like a protracted culture shock, but, um, because a place like this is a lot slower. It, you're, you know, you're not confronted with it as immediately as you are in a place like New York city. So it takes a minute for, for the language of a place to sort of arrive yeah. into you, you know, much smaller community. It's, it's, a, um, you know, it's based, you know, it's a community within a national park, like I said, so it's like phenomenally beautiful and, and it's also temperate. So um, this, it has very, very subtle season changes. Um, and, uh, yeah, it, it just, I, I'm, I, I feel like I'm, it's like siphoning into me a lot slower, you know? So I'm kind of like understanding like social dynamics are so different in a tiny little town, you know? Um, in some respects you have to be a lot more careful. Like things are much more seismic. Mm-hmm. because you know you're only dealing with like a small pool of people so um exchanges with one another and, and emotional connections become more seismic um whereas in new york it's like there's always like people are just bouncing off of each other in all different directions and there's so many so many options and you know um yeah so it's it's uh it's it's harder to be distracted here which is like a double-edged sword right 
Yeah, that contrast could lend itself not only to your art, but maybe just as a, a whole kind of cathartic sense of well-being. Do you find it's working well for you when you say that these things are slowly coming to you and you're starting to realize them? Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, I, I, um, uh, I don't, you know, I don't look at, you know, so, some of it's difficult, but I look at that as beneficial too, you know, if that makes any sense. Yeah, sure. Um, um but, uh, um, the odds, obvious positive aspects of this place, for instance, is that it's like, um, you know, people moved up here in the sixties, part of that whole new kind of hippie conscious revolution, you know, mm -hmm. and they came up here to start living in conscious community. Um, uh, maybe hearkening back the way people used to live, um, pre industrialization or something. So, so, and, and then that, that whole, there's ghosts of that that are happening around the country, like the whole farm to table movement, like being, you know, eating food that's grown locally, supporting local artisans, stuff like that. You know, that's all sort of happening around the country that this is like the sort of like OG spot for that, you know? <laughs> um, so, so it really feels worn in, in that way. It really feels like the, the community is very strong and, 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 um, people are very, conscious of living and understanding the community that they live in. Um, and so there's like, uh, any like social function, there's like, you know, the, the elder people, there's little kids, there's everybody involved, you know, where, um, New York was always tends, tends to be like one demographic. Why did your girlfriend end up there? Well, she's been out here for a number of years. She's, I think she's, this is like her seventh year out here. So she, she, uh, I mean, she, she kind of gypsied around for a while and ended up out here and found a community that suited her. So she's just decided to stay. And, and, uh, she does, um, she does cranial sacral therapy. Beautiful. Which is like, um, and she, and she's also part of a dance community that, um, there's a, a very specific, um, kind of dance movement that's happening in the Bay area mm -hmm. that she's a part of. Um, that's kind of, I guess, you know, c c I guess you'd call it, it's not modern dance. It's not postmodern. It's like, I guess they call it contemporary dance. What um, kind of, what kind of dance is contemporary dance? Well, it's like, sh it's really, it's, it's pretty out there stuff. Like, uh, a lot of it, it's like dance, but then it's also, um, uh, related to like somatic movement, which I don't totally understand, but, um, uh, there's this like matriarch Bonnie Brain Bainbridge Cohen that has like uh, has all this like uh, somatic movement that ha it's like sort of mind body centering and stuff. But then it's like that's like a sort of a deeper kind of almost like yogic aspect. Um, but then but then like the art side, um, the dance side um, gets into sort of like more. It's more interested in like utilitarian ways of movement rather than sort of like dance like it doesn't have any uh doesn't have any roots in ballet even modern dance i guess kind of had roots in ballet sure this doesn't have any formal roots in ballet hmm. um it's more taking from like well it's like you know like have a piece about like you know what it you know janitorial movement or something sure like know? like proper function and stuff yeah and how the how the body is at rest oh, wow. and how the body is under stress and how like trying to like, you know, move, uh, like her last piece had to do with like the endocrine system, mm -hmm. which is pretty out there. <laughs> wow. Yeah. No, it's, it seems like you're, so it's, you're learning it's a, whole, a lot. It's a whole new world for me. So I'm just kind of like learning. Well, that's neat, man. The fact that you're with someone else who's an artist too. I mean, that's gotta be a pretty interesting conversation around your table from time to time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. For sure. Salem. Tell me about Salem. What was it like growing up uh, as a kid? I, I, I was born in Salem, I, I, but I grew up in Manchester, Mass., which is um, a couple towns north. So you were just born there, and then they, sh they shipped you out somewhere else. And uh, what was it like growing up? And uh, you know, w how did music kind of come into the house? This is the way that I normally start these conversations. Tell me about your, your childhood. Music came uh, just through, I don't you know... I, like through an interest of wanting to play, like for whatever reason, like, uh, it wasn't something that was in my house. I was, my, my house was more centered around visual art. My mom was a painter, 
I always, I was like a obsessive drawer growing up <laughs> and so visual art was always the thing that I, um, define my, I define myself as a visual artist, I guess, more than a, more than a musician. And then, um, um, uh, you know, I, and then I, I fell in love with music in my, you know, adolescence and then, um, you know, like idealized, like I was listening to like punk rock and, you know, that I like, that I learned through like sk the skateboarding culture, I guess, you know, and then like me and my friends, like just decided to put a band together and I started playing bass and because my friend was already playing drums and then his cousin was play already playing guitar. So I had to fill the other missing piece. So I just <laughs> arbitrarily started playing bass. Um, what kind of stuff? I mean, my first, my first look, there was a lot of, you know, I was listening to Minor Threat, Black Flag, Wrecking Crew, local, local hardcore bands like Slapshot and Wrecking Crew is also local, mm -hmm. you know, DC, um, you know, Minor Threat, then onto Fugazi, Youth of Today, Crow Mags, like a lot of hardcore and like punk rock. And then I think the first band that really, a, a lot of that stuff was just, just part of the community, the zeitgeist that I was in. And I don't necessarily know if I had much of a connection to a lot of the music in a personal way. The first band that I really connected with was, um, Bad Brains. Nice. And, uh, and like, you know, uh, post rock of, um, rock for light, like, like the quickness that record really like hit me. Cause I think there was more, there was more, uh, musicianship or something or, you know, it's satisfied, like, something that wanted to like materialize in me as a musician. And then that, and then, and then, um, and then that sort of like went, that sort of like quickly forayed into like a lot of like, um, like prog rock and stuff. Uh, and, and we were just like, I don't know, we got like really into like Mahavishnu orchestra and like Frank Zappa and oh, wow. stuff like that. And we would just kind of try to like, pretend like we were like these shredders you know <laughs> you probably kind of were at the time too if you guys are but, like uh, what yeah, you're... I, don't know. I wish there, there's a bunch of four track recordings of us that trio we used to get together every like as much as we could in, in my friend pete's basement nice and just like rip bong hits and like play for hours <laughs> you know it's funny when you said zappa I kind of hear some of that stuff that comes through in some of your music. Is that huh. is that it's, it's funny like, to you? <laughs> uh, I mean, it would make sense, you know. Yeah, I, um, he was pretty big in a, during like the formative years, I guess. Yeah, and you know what's crazy too? I don't know if you've seen this. There's a new documentary. It's like Zappa by Zappa or something. I forget, but like he, I saw that. yeah, yeah, and it's crazy how straight he was. Yeah, that makes sense to me, though. You know. Yeah. I mean that stuff is like through composed music you know he's a composer oh yeah absolutely I mean, as much as you can be a composer within like the genre of rock and roll like he is a composer so i mean hmm. um i don't think there there is a there's no way that he could he could have completed that but he could have like had that output if, if he wasn't uh clear-minded sure you know? yeah sure that specific form demanded kind of sobriety mm -hmm. not not all kinds of music demand that i guess you know right yeah some can't come out of the fog of like drug abuse you know, mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And it's, you know, it's like neither good nor bad. It just is what it is. Yeah, sure. I mean, some people can do it. Some people can't. Some, some music suffers with or without it. But right. As I think of you, you know, being a teenager, you know, you're skateboarding, listening to Bad Brains, uh, you know, trying to still do some of the painting on the side. When did it move from being kind of like a basement jam thing to you saying, I want to pursue this a little bit more seriously? Well, not till much later, because I, you know, kept the, the vision of myself as a, as, as like having a fine art career, a visual fine art career. And I graduated high school, I took, took a couple of years off and just sort of loafed around the country you know, for a little bit. And then I ended up going to art back, back to Boston to art school. And then and I spent five years there. And you know, with a focus on, uh, figurative painting. Mm -hmm. So I was like really interested in like, um, portraiture. And then I ended up moving to New York cause that's what, that's what you do. I suppose if you're, if you're in the visual arts 
and you want to be part of some sort of like more critical dialogue that's going on. I guess you, you know, that tends to be where people go. And then once I got to New York, um, I had an acoustic, I had a, I always had, once I, once I left high school, I didn't have those guys. Like I never was part, I never was, I never was in bands or anything. It was the only, the only people I ever really played music with were my friends growing up. And, and that was just for fun. And then, um, but music was really important. So I, after I left high school, I had an acoustic guitar and I just like mess around on it because bass isn't really like a solo instrument. <laughs> yeah. Oh no? yeah. And then, and then as I had the guitar, I started like learning, I slowly started learning chords and, and then like, you know, uh, all the while I'm like focusing on, on visual art. And, and then I, and then I got interested in, in songwriters, um, because I, I was interested in structure, you know, in like, in, in, uh, I guess in a way like composition, uh, you know, plays into, of course, into, into painting. And then, and then my, my interest in composition, I think sort of just forayed into music. And then I, and then, and then I, um, uh, got interested. I sort of reeducated myself with like songwriter songwriters, you know, who were they? Well, I just sort of went back to the drawing board and like listened. I didn't. I didn't start listening to the Beatles until I was like in my twenties. You right. know, David Bowie, Neil Neil Young, Bob Dylan, like yeah. all the big guys. Like I just, it, you know, I had. I was listening to like. Uh, I sort of went from punk rock to fusion into like jazz, you know, mm-hmm. and then, and I wasn't really listening to. I did. I hadn't really listened to that that more pop songwriting stuff, and so. I kind of went back to the drawing board with that stuff and got really into it. And then, um, and then songwriting just kind of came out of that. And then I, when I moved to New York, um, logistically, it, it seemed a lot more difficult than I had realized to like have a place to live, but then also have a studio on top of that where I could paint and not like, cause you can't fume out your, you can't really paint where you live if you're painting with oil paints. Right. So there was like a lot of logistic things that, that prevented me from, from painting and I, and meanwhile, I had my guitar and then I started going to these open mics just for fun. Cause I, I realized that I had, a, I had, I could sing and I would like play these little songs that I was writing for friends and they seemed to like it. And so I started going to these open mics in New York and, um, people seemed to respond. And then it just, um, and then because I did, I wasn't able to paint in the way that I was used to, I think my creative mind just dumped, just went right into songwriting you know and then it just took over see it's funny that that people like you and i that did the visual art thing and then as music kind of lends itself to you it does really feel if it feels and fills that void doesn't it you know it's like that thing that artists have whether it's you know to paint on a canvas or write lyrics or to compose music it's it's very strange how those two kind of lend themselves to each other even you know as you talk about your girlfriend like dancing and things like that did you know from an early age that you just had to be creative yeah i mean i i uh i'm like a pretty i have a specific kind of a different relationship to i never think of myself as to be honest like I always think of myself as more of a nuts and bolts guy. <laughs> I never really thought of myself as an artist, to be to be frank. I, I I have a I have a I have a gift for draftsmanship in with with um in visual arts. Like I could always draw. I just can do it. Right. But I always felt like there was other there were other people with like less talent that were more artistic and more creative than me you might have been like more of the blueprint kind of guy. Like when you say like drafting, you had this natural ability to create art, but at the same time, it was a little bit more practical than say the kid sitting next to you with a, a pile of clay. I've always been very observational and I love sitting and drawing people. And I think I have a, I have a, I have a good ability to capture sort of an essence of someone. Um, and there's, there's, you know, and, and in the end you have art, whatever that means, you know, it's like, it's conveying like an intangible emotion through a specific form, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's bringing the viewer into a place that they haven't experienced before, I suppose, like through whatever you've done formally, like, and so, um, but I've never had any sort of grand design or any sort of idea of like what it is about myself that I want to express. It's just like, I just like sort of 
sponge stuff from the world around me and then like, you know, sort of organize it into these little forms. And, and I'm very formal in that way. Like I, you know, formal meaning like, you know, the nuts and bolts of the craft, you know, like I love, I love thinking about like writing a song. Like I love thinking about like the, 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 the balance and the design of the song, like almost like as a structural thing, like a, right. like a, um, like an architectural blueprint or something. And then, and then the, the emotive art quote unquote aspect of it, um, is just inherent in it. Like, I don't really think about it. It just kind of like goes along for the ride. Mm-hmm. Oh. Yeah. That's interesting. Cause I, I think of you and your lyrics and even, I mean, some of the, the imagery on the records and things like that, you seem to be a little bit more out there as opposed to being like the practical artist but, but that's certainly a compliment whether you take it that way or not well thank you i yeah. mean i but but i also i also listen to a you know i'm i try to uh expose myself to a, a wide range of things i mean so you know um if uh i think it's all of you know art is all about education in in, in terms of understanding the form of art right mm-hmm. like like and in music, it's the same thing. Um, uh, if if you were you know if if you were back in the Baroque era and you you know you were listening you were at a church service and you're listening to Bach, you know, um, and then all of a sudden like out of nowhere, you know, someone pretty provincial now like the Rolling Stones, for instance, mm-hmm. you know, it's just good old fashioned rock and roll. Sure. But if like if they were to come on after Bach during the Baroque era and you, it would sound like noise. It would sound like cacophony to your ear probably. Sure. So it, so then, so then it's like we, we've been educated through music, um, that, um, through radio and, you know, music being a, a such, uh, so prevalent in popular culture and, 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 you know, um, given to the masses constantly. So everyone's sort of educated by it. And so, um, but then there's, but then some people like, you know, uh, I'm into, I guess, uh, uh, I'm so interested in, in music as a form that I listen to a, you know, a lot of different kinds of stuff that may be sort of outside of the, the thread that, that is, you know, that is like, uh, within like the, 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 the general zeitgeist. So then it seems like I'm more abstract, but like, I'm working within some sort of form that I that I'm interested in. Do you know what I mean? Sure. Yeah. Does that make sense? Like, there's, you can't sort of exist outside of reference in your mind. You, you know, because we're everything's interdependent. You know, mm-hmm. as an artist, it's like I'm always sort of referencing something, whether I even know it or not. Yeah, I was know? just going to say sometimes that's more of a subconscious thing, even. And and it's funny too because I've had other people that listen to my music and then say, "Man, this really sounds like that," and I'm like, "Wow, that's kind of crazy because I haven't even listened to that." And when you took it out there, were people comparing you to anything else because you've got this beautiful falsetto? Did you did you find a, that voice early on? Well, you know, people. I mean, it's funny you say like, it's not like being compared to things, and you're like, "Oh, you know, yeah, maybe it's something that like came through." You know, ten years ago, you were like really obsessed with something, and then it sort of finally makes its way out, or it like. But I, I'm always compared to people that I never even listened to. <laughs> like, like, like you. Well, I, mean, well, I mean, originally I was like, people would say Jeff Buckley because he was like, you know, he was like the big, the big shot. Yeah, falsetto at the time, guy. I was like, yeah, falsetto, like warbly falsetto, like. And uh, and I like Jeff Buckley, all right. You know, it's never really like never really like hit me too deep, you know, mm-hmm. um, him and then Paul Simon, I get a lot. Hmm. Yeah, I can see, I, I, see I can hear Paul Simon, but I, but he's another guy that I never really like dug very deeply into. When you first started to write songs though, did you, did you just simply open up your mouth and go like, Oh, whoa, I kind of have this higher register thing or yeah. Yeah. Was it just something just that was forever. more comfortable to you? Yeah. yeah it's, it seemed like, um, that register, I guess just, uh, seemed the most emotive for what I was trying to, what I was trying to convey, mm-hmm. I guess. Mm-hmm. I, I, I think my, I think I've, I've, I've like maybe consciously and subconsciously like, um, uh, started, uh, w- working in a lower register, like singing in a lower register in the last few years, I think. Mm-hmm. Did you have a collection 
of songs that your friends were kind of like, hey, I like that song, I like that song. Is that how that first kind of, uh, you know, little EP came out on uh, on Mill Pond? Um the, the first Luke Temple record? Yeah, you know, like, let's talk about after you've written some songs and played on an open stage or whatever. Where did it go from there? Um, yeah, it was just, I, I had a bunch of failed attempts at, at recording records that are existing somewhere. but <laughs> or, or, I mean, it, you know, whether they were failures objectively or not, it, subjectively, I, you know, didn't put, didn't release them or didn't have a label at the time. And, and then, um, someone bootlegged them, <laughs> I guess. Yeah. I mean, I have, fr- I have a friend actually, the T, um, T Lieberson, who is in here we go magic. She has some, somehow she has some, like one of my, the first, uh, demo albums that I made. I don't even want to hear it though. <laughs> <laughs> this label mill pond reached out to me that was in Seattle. How did, how did that happen? How did they even know who you were? He knew Mike Manning was the guy that it's now defunct. It's not around anymore, mm-hmm. but, um, he, uh, he was a friend of a friend somehow. I can't even remember the connection to be honest, but he just sent me an email and said he was a fan that he was interested in, um, in helping me make a record. And I had my, my girlfriend at the time who was also a dancer. Um, look at you. She got offered, she got offered to be in a company that was out in Seattle and Mike Manning of Mill Pond was in Seattle. We both got these opportunities at the same time in Seattle. So hmm. we moved to Seattle for a year and I, she joined that dance company and I, and I, um, made the record and yeah, that was it. And then, um, lasted out there for about a year and then came back to New. We broke up and I came back to New York. The timeline is like Oh five when you were out there. Yeah. Yeah. Something like that. Oh four or five. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then made two records with him. And as to your question, like how, how did I choose those songs or whatever? I mean, I just, um, you know, I've been writing for a couple of years at that point and I, I just chose whatever songs I felt like were the strongest for whatever reason. And, um, yeah, I mean, there was like such growing pains, those first two records, just to just know, just it's one thing to like write a song and to perform it in a coffee shop right. or in, a, in an open mic. And then it's another thing to be in a studio and to be like, you know, trapping those songs in some format forever, you know, and, and knowing like how to operate in a studio and knowing what, what, what production means and like, you know, how to get how to, you know, how to sort of translate something soulful and, you know, um, and the alchemy of all of that, which was, was totally elusive to me. I didn't understand it at all. And I feel like that's, st- that's still something that I'm, I'm like trying to, un- I'm trying to learn. But isn't that the beauty of it too? Is it so you're not getting bored and that there is this everlasting rabbit hole that you can go down all the, all the time when you're recording and, and creating music? Yeah, absolutely. That's what keeps you doing it. I, I think so. And it's funny too, because my first introduction to you, and I hope my buddy uh, Kai listens to this because I remember he gave me um, a CDR of Snow Beast and we were driving around listening to this thing. And there's the uh, song that has, um, I, I guess it's like a melodica in it. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. And I remember thinking how some of the chord structures and some of the way that the, and not, I don't want to say like the production, but it was something like I had never quite heard before. Mm. And that in itself must be kind of like a check, a check mark next to the, you know, the box that says that it's not just, you know, another run of the mill kind of like sad guy with his acoustic guitar doing, you know, the, the same old stuff that we've heard time and time again. I want to know when you're in the studio and you're, you're telling me that you've kind of got a problem with kind of committing these things, you know, to tape because they're, they're going to last forever. But were you the only... Well, I don't worry about that anymore. That, that was, that was, a, well, that I mean, was just at the beginning. Yeah, I mean, like early on. Let's talk about like for those yeah. two songs, or for those two records, pardon me, Hold a Match and, and Snow Beast. Were you the only one that was coming up with all those different quirky things? The first record was um, uh, my friend Rob Stillman. He came from the jazz world. He's a saxophone, saxophonist, and uh, and then he sort of went into sort of more avant-garde stuff. He uh, he did a lot of the horn arrangements on that first record. Mm-hmm. There was like um, the song. I wrote all the songs. You know, um, I I think back then, like the first record, I was really 
Mm-hmm. I was really obsessed with the Beatles, you know, and um, the Beatles like always have, there's one aspect, there's one sort of like, I guess you call it like one money moment in, in every, every song, one little, one like sort of turn of phrase or one melodic shift or that sort of throws it on its ear. Right. And gives it its, its specific character, you know? Um, and, uh, and that's what I was trying to, you know, trying to do was find that one little, that one little hard left out of nowhere that kind of like gives the song its own little signature. I was really obsessed with that. That's that little check mark that I was just talking about, you know, mission accomplished. Yeah. Cause there's, you know, there's nothing that I could particularly even compare it to. And to me, that is the biggest accomplishment ever. That's cool. Thank you. Yeah. So jumping from 07 after Snow Beast, two years later, the first Here We Go Magic record comes out. How did this go from more of a solo outing to having, you know, these other, well, I guess there was only two other members at the at the time that you guys were a band? Mm, yeah, well, well, the, that record, I made that record myself. So what was so different musically from uh, Here We Go Magic? And I mean, you had a moniker, you had a different moniker other than your own name. Why the, what was that decision about? I think it was, I was, uh, I mean, I had only made two records, but I was, um, I was frustrated <clears throat> with kind of being lumped in like the singer songwriter category. Cause a lot of times I would get put on bills with other, other bands that, um, didn't feel like what weren't very inspiring to me was I wasn't, I wasn't sort of like being, um, I wasn't finding myself in like the community, um, of musicians that was that that felt like very forwarding or inspiring and I so I wanted to sort of like try to exist I wanted to like I, I feel I feel like I'm more of a um I guess I feel like more of a composer in a way mm-hmm. and uh and or a producer or something and so I wanted to kind of dissolve my own identity in there it all seems pretty trite now in, in, in retrospect, you know, like I don't care about any of that now. It's like, you know, like labels aside, it's like music is music and there's, there's depth as long as someone's true and as someone is really communicating something, mm-hmm. um, not for the sake of, of, of what they think they should be doing or, you know, um, or anything like that, then, then I, then it, there's, there's, there's beauty in it, you know, so it's across the board, you know, Mm -hmm. and, and I think I was like me, I I think to be honest, like a lot of my early decisions were made from, um, some feeling of insecurity really. And, and wanting to like really desperately wanting to sort of like define myself by being undefined, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean that in itself is kind of the answer right there. Right. And then, and then it, and then it became interesting to me, like here we go magic from a formal standpoint became interest. I became interested in like, rather than taking those, like trying to create these really complex structures, like the, the way I was, what I was interested in with my previous like solo efforts. I, I was like, um, repetition and simplicity became really interesting to me. Rhythmic, rhythmic feel just alone without too many things getting in the way became really interesting. Mm-hmm. And so yeah, I like really simplified like the, the melodic and harmonic like aspects of the music, like they simplified it. So I had a four track and I had been recording on that for years, like before I ever really started taking music seriously, I was making these little four track recordings and, and, um, and then I would make my quote unquote like albums in proper studios. And at a certain point I just realized that there was like this vitality in the, in the four track stuff that I wasn't getting in the studio. Wow. And I think because I was like doing it so innocently, um, and, and without, without pressure where I wasn't press putting any pressure on myself. And there's something inherent in like the set in, in the, um, sound quality of, of, of a cassette recording that, um, maybe it's nostalgia. I don't know, but, Mm -hmm. but there's something, um, there's a patina that's put on it that, um, I really learned to love. And, uh, you know, and then I, I think I, I got more familiar with like the, the Smithsonian recordings, Alan Lomax and, 
and so just as an aesthetic, it seemed like it's interesting to me. And, um, then I think I was like, let's really, got, I got, um, introduced to Arthur Russell nice. that first, the first here go magic record. I got introduced to him. And so all of that was just went into it. Hmm. So from 2009, the album's done. Essentially you released this self-titled here we go magic record. I imagine you put the band together, you get out, you do some touring, and you're starting to get different kinds of attention than you did with your solo stuff. So how does it become an official, you know, band with, uh, you know, like you said, uh, Christina and Jen on Pigeons? Um, or, yeah, I guess for Pigeons, because Secretly uh, Canadian is in the fold now as well. So tell me, what was the shift from that one year, 09 to like 2010, as opposed to it being just a, a, a new name? Now it's actually a band. Um, because that was also a novelty for me, having a band, a consistent band, and working within a band and just being a part of the of the band mm -hmm. was interesting. Um, so I wanted to do that, and and the and the the Here We Go Magic that first record seemed like a good vehicle for it. You know, it's like it's ensemble based music. It wasn't they're not songs that I could sing by myself. So I needed a band. How did you know who was going to be in the band? Uh, there was some, just some trial and error, you know. Um, the drummer was a guy, um, Pete Hale, that I that I was playing with around that time, just having fun, jamming with. Um, we went through a, a few bassists before we fell on Jen Turner, who's, um, I mean, she's just the one of the, if not the best musician, most creative musician I've ever played with. So she was a no-brainer. Um, I think people really like. People who are like deep in the in the Here We Go Magic catalog really like trip on on Jen specifically like the bass the bass on on like a different ship and and pigeons is like pretty next level she's she's unbelievable yeah that's an understatement yeah totally just all around musician she's just unbelievable so, um, and then uh, I mean, everyone was really special in that band, you know. And Mike Mike Block, who's the guitarist, was my roommate at the time, and he had played some in in um, in uh, Luke Temple, different Luke Temple outfits, and and uh, and so we we knew each other, we understood each other musically, and he um, he comes from a, um, a classical via flamenco background, and so he had this like really from the flamenco he had this really percussive way of playing he didn't um he didn't play he didn't come up playing electric guitar he came up playing classical and so um he played you know you pl you, you can be much more physical on a classical guitar especially with flamenco there's a lot of tapping on the guitar you know it's a really primal way of like treating the instrument and and he had a he attacked the electric guitar in the same way he would a classical, which I thought was a really, really interesting approach. You know, mm -hmm. I don't even know if he realized he did, he was doing that, but he developed this like <clears throat> really idiosyncratic way of playing and, and that involved finger style, which, which I, cause I came up playing acoustic guitar. And so I sort of was doing these like finger style, this finger style too. And then, so we, we got into this, like, like this, like, um, these like guitar parts that would sort of go in rounds with each other. Mm -hmm. um, and that became sort of a sound, you know, and then, and then Pete, the drummer, um, was really into, um, and we were all into like all that crowd stuff, you know? Yeah. Um, so he, he kind of brought that motoric kind of like really simple, um, backbeat. Um, and yeah, I mean, and then teeny, um, the, the, the keyboardist, she came from more of a R and B, um, place. Um, and so she sort of was interested in like, um, uh, R and B and jazz. And so, so she was kind of more interested in some like sort of dense vocal stuff, like dense vocal harmonies and, uh, yeah, just all kind of that whole band rounded itself off pretty well, pretty naturally special moment unfortunately things can't last forever you know i mean yeah. but it was it, it was good while it lasted that band yeah i was happy that i got to see that band in that incarnation as well where you were touring you know the grizzly bear tour that happened and uh and then again i think the last time that you came back it was uh it might have been just 
just for a different ship, I think, which I, I kind of want to get there too, because, because mm-hmm. of course, you know, you get somebody like Nigel involved, Nigel Godrich. Um, yeah. But it was, it was weird. It was a little bit of a shift. It was almost kind of like some of the tempos, kind of the, the songs themselves just sounded a little bit richer. And, you know, tell me, how did Nigel get involved with this thing? Was this after like Glastonbury or something like that? Did I read? Yeah, he um, he saw our set at Glastonbury, and um, and then he we played. We happened to be doing some shows with Broken Social Scene, and um, he was really good friends with them. Mm-hmm. And uh, and when we played in London, he came to the show, and so he just sort of like miraculously kind of showed up because he happened to be friends with them and, and he saw us again. And then, um, and then we played in France in, in Paris and he showed up again at another show. And at that point it seemed like, you know, maybe he's actually interested in, <laughs> maybe he's poaching us or something. I don't know. But, <laughs> but then we just sort of, we, we, we developed a friendship and, and, you know, loosely talked about maybe working together and, um, and then it just kind of happened at a certain point. His schedule was open and it was time for us to make another record. And so did he come to you or did you guys go to him? Well, we, 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 we both, we both met in LA because right. uh, we were living in New York, obviously. And then he, he had a house in LA and, um, so he wanted to, he wanted to do the, he initially make the record in LA. And so we went and, um, worked at, at, uh, this guy, Jonathan Wilson's studio in Echo Park. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we did the first, the first bunch of recording there. I think we were there for a month. And, uh, and that session was kind of just getting to know each other. Um, and then after that, we went to his studio in London and, and did the rest of the recording there. Was it uh, stressful for you or was it a really great energy kind of thing? The first, the first sessions were stressful because I had sort of put him on this crazy pedestal and I put all this pressure on myself, um, you know, to make like the record of a lifetime or something because I didn't know if that opportunity would come again, you know. Do you think that uh, you did that? I don't know. I don't know. I'm, pr- I'm proud of it. It's pretty, it's it's pretty like, fucking great record, man. <laughs> thank you. Uh, like I'm sure even you can sit back and go, wow, this record sounds amazing. Yeah, I it definitely sounds amazing. I know that. <laughs> well, even know? the songs too. I mean, just as a as a complete package, that is the one. Don't get me wrong. I, I mean, I I, I know your career. I know your discography. That one just for me. I, yeah, I still go back and I, I listen to that one all of the time, all the time. I I think we did. I think we did a good job. When <laughs> when we, when we finally, when the dust settled a little bit and we got to know each other better, and you know. He, he just became like a human and a friend. Um, <laughs> it's nice when that happens, eh? <laughs> went to, um, we went to London to work the second, for the, the second part of the recording. Then, then it was really, um, then, it, then we really dug in. The majority of that record was made in, in, uh, in London. Yeah, it's funny. Th- I get so nostalgic thinking about that. <laughs> I haven't thought about it in so long, but that was an amazing time. You know, that's nice when we can talk about these things because I have a memory of that record. I can't imagine what it's like, you know, for someone like you to kind of look at those things in retrospect. But the mm. fact that, dude, like, I mean, the fact that you play Glastonbury in itself, is that not kind of a crazy thing to think about? That, I mean, that, that was a crazy, that was a crazy <laughs> experience for other reasons, like, let alone like the... Dish, the, man, the, dish. Why? Why? Well, I mean, we, we got there... Uh, we had been, we were on a crazy tour, like, you know, I think that year we played like over 200 shows or something. Wow. So it was like Glastonbury, like we didn't really know, Glastonbury is this, you know, huge historic festival in, in England, but I don't think we really even. <laughs> you weren't aware? Like, separated it from all the other like crazy things that we were doing on that tour. And we, it was just another festival we were playing and it, but it happened to be like, 10 times the size it turns out than any other thing we'd ever done. And we got there just to pick up our credentials. And then we were playing the next day. Um, and we were going to, we had a hotel booked and we were going to just go, go to our hotel, um, which is pretty far away. Glass and like in the middle of the countryside, you know, mm-hmm. and, uh, 
and we were going to go to our hotel and then just go the next day to play because we, we were playing or we were playing at like 11 in the morning. Um, was there still was there still a there, bunch of people there at, even at 11, man? Because like th- those people don't go to sleep. That's a, that place is a it's a city, Glastonbury. Yeah, well, I'll get I'll get to that. All right, all right. It's part of it. um, so we got there, and it was like you know, I mean it's it is it's like a city. It's like this weird, like temporary city. And once we got there, we we're like, we got, we gotta just stay, man. Like, and we didn't have we didn't have tents, or we didn't, you know, people like buy little, they they could like, they 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 set up tents in in certain areas, and and you have to like prepare, you have to like for that kind of thing. And we were not prepared at all, so <laughs> we just like won it, and we just like went into the festival, and we all separated into look into. Like me and me and Pete, the drummer, kind of went off into a, as a pair, and then the girls went off, and then Mike kind of did his own thing, and um, we all had like these crazy nights, and me and Pete ended up like sleeping on this really steep hill. Like I don't remember even falling asleep. Like we just like laid down on this hill and like woke up with like the sun beating down, and. Um, didn't have any way of telling time so we like woke up and we had stayed up all night we didn't know if we missed our show already or oh, whatever oh no. wow and we ended up like running to we knew where the stage was luckily we found the stage and it turns out that we had to be on in like 15 minutes or something <laughs> and everybody just kind of like by the grace of god like ended up at the stage on time mike slept under a car in the parking lot um <laughs> I think the girls met some guys or something and like stayed like <laughs> with some dudes and like we just and everybody was like you know going on like 15 minutes of sleep and like super hungover. How was the set? And, and well the set at first it was kind of I mean I was like so hungover and like I felt I had a like pounding headache and I didn't feel good and we were playing and like there was um and it was kind of depressing like there was you know, people, it was either people like up, people that were like up from the night before, just kind of zombie, zombified, like sort of swaying on their feet, staring at us. Or, or if, or it was like family time, you know, like the people that got a good night's sleep with their kids. So it wasn't, it wasn't like the optimal set, but I was trying to like, I was trying to keep a good attitude. And, um, and there was two guys in the front row that were dancing really hard. And so I was focusing on them. And it turns out that it was Tom York and Nigel Godrich. Come on. Yeah. So, And I, I quickly realized that it was Tom York. I didn't recognize Nigel, but I, I, I recognized Tom York. And so I, I didn't want to say anything to the rest of the band because I didn't want anyone to trip out about it and like maybe like lose their cool or something. Mm-hmm. Barf. Um, <laughs> lose their mind after 15 minutes of sleep to find out that... Tom York is uh, is digging it. Not only like there to watch the show, but dancing at 11 a.m. Yeah, that's a yeah, good. Was, so it, Nigel obviously was just like, you got to come see these guys. Well, I think Tom brought Nigel actually. Oh wow! So what was the connection there? He just he bought your records. I think he knew. I think he knew our record. Yeah. Wow, that's kind of neat. He knew, he knew. I think, or he knew the song Tunnel Vision. He was a fan of that song. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's crazy. So that thing happens. You guys have done all of these tours, these festivals, and then a couple of years later, um, if I'm not mistaken, it's Be Small comes along. Mm-hmm. And where have you gone from there? Because now you've got a brand new solo record now that is under your your name again. Was, did something transpire from Be Small until, you know, I guess just last year, which by the way, I have to tell you that this record, um, A Hand Through the Cellar Door, it's a beautiful record. There's some really heavy stuff that's on this as well. And it's, I, 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 I'm struggling to kind of think of the first thing that I, I thought of when I heard this record because it didn't sound like the old Luke Temple. This one sounds like a little bit, maybe a little bit more delicate, maybe a little bit more, um, you're, you're just simply talking about some things that are, are more matter of fact on this record. Did something transpire yeah. between the last Here We Go Magic record and when you put out this this new solo record? Obviously, you well, told me. Well, the solo you... record actually was recorded before the Here We Go Magic record. Okay, yeah. Tell me about that. Why? Why? Why did one come before the other then? 
Um, well, that the solo record was I, I had put this that trio together that was that that is on that record that solo record, and mm-hmm. we were playing and playing around New York, and um, and I, I wrote all of the all of these narrative based songs, and I was just something I was you know rather than kind of working in the more kind of like free form lyrical way that I usually work, I was like just had the thought of just writing some some more topical or or or, or more specifically narrative based tunes Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, just drawing from things like stories in my life. So so there is some autobiographical stuff on, on that record. I mean, all all of it is, I mean, there's a couple songs that are still pretty like amorphous or, you know, aren't aren't as specific. Like man, that, the the story about that, that guy and the, is it like a, a fucking car accident and stuff is all that, that's all real. Yeah, that's all real. Yeah. Man, yeah, I remember just playing that song for friends before, and they're like, "This, this is awful." <laughs> you know, the story itself, like, is just holy fuck. How many of us can relate to something like that? But you said that this was certainly, you know, an autobiographical thing. But this record was. Are you telling me that a hand through the cellar door was written and recorded before Be Small? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then um. Uh, I sort of sat on it for a while. There was a number of other songs that were recorded that I that I I didn't use. I recorded it, and for whatever reason, it just sort of like um, kind of sunk into the archives for a minute, and I didn't really like think about putting it out. It was something that I had I had wrote those songs, I'd written those songs, and and um uh, and needed to record them, and I had the money to do it. I went into a studio and. We, we, we cut that record in two days and then it just sort of, I think it all happened so fast that I didn't really take it very seriously and I didn't know who was going to put it out quite yet. Um, so I just kind of shelved it for a while. And then I knew that I was, um, I knew that I was going to start working on the next Here Go Magic record. And once that started, um, I just sort of over that took took me over, I guess. And, and, um, uh, and then I just, uh, released the, the, you know, cause there's some, there was some structure around the release of the Here We Go Magic record. It was like, I, it was a bit more anticipated. I, I knew I was going to do a bunch of touring around it, all that. And the, 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 the solo record, I, you know, it, I wasn't sure like how much energy would go, you know, be around that record. And so I just kind of, uh, didn't think about it for a while. And then after the Here Go Magic record came out, it just seemed like, uh, then I kind of remembered it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad yeah. you, I'm glad you did. Cause it's a pretty important record. I mean, especially, mm. you know, especially Thank not you. only as a moment in time, you know, because you had these things to share, but even, you know, sonically, as far as your entire library of music goes, this thing, it, it seems to fit really, really lovely in the mix. Mm, thank you. What's uh, what's next for you now? What what's going on? What what do you do now? What's happening? Well, I just I um, I just finished the record that I I don't really want to I can't really say because I'm going I'm going under a new name for a, a different project. Okay. And I don't want to let the cat out of the bag. Okay. About it. you might hear about it, but unfortunately I can't tell you what it is. Um, but it's another uh. Uh, it's another like it's a four track record. It's nice. kind of like in line with the first Here We Go Magic. I've wor- worked on it for the last year. That's exciting. And, uh, yeah, it's kind of like a weird sort of sort of trippy dance record, kind of mm. in a way. Um, maybe like I don't know if you're familiar with Good Mood Fool. Mm-hmm. Great record. That and and um, maybe mixed with like the first Here We Go Magic record in production. Hmm. Uh, yeah, it's kind of. But but I'm going under a, a new name so, All right. and I just I actually just released the um, the first single uh, a couple weeks ago, so so, so that yeah. It, it, so if I'm to be if I'm hearing you correctly, you've already released one of the singles from this thing, uh-huh. but it's under a completely different name. Correct. Yeah. But if I Google it, I can find it. Yeah, but you will, but there's no connection to me, so. This is, you're, you're sort of operating in a vacuum. <laughs> you're, you're you're killing me here. 
Um, but uh, there's that, and then I, you know, I want to. I'm probably, um, you know, I'll make another Here I Go Magic record at a certain point. I mean, I'm always recording. It's just, it's just uh, separating things into into albums is the is the thing. You know, like narrowing stuff down. I have so many records I want to make. Um, and, uh, whether it's going to be a hero go magic thing, whether it's going to be Luke temple, whether it's going to be this other new project, I don't, you know, that's, that's just that th those are the decisions I have to make. It's like, it's a good, you know, it's a good problem to have though, isn't it? Sure. Yeah. Man. Well, I mean, and the other problem is like just money, <laughs> like, get okay. having the money to do it. That's yeah. that, that's the biggest, that's the biggest hurdle, but it, it tends to, it tends to show up when I need it. So <laughs> you say you have that problem too. Wow. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> well, Luke, uh, no matter what you are about to get your, your hand involved with here, I'm, I look forward to the future and I'm really honored and humbled that you decided to come and have this conversation with me today. Because like I said, I mean, it's been, man, it's been 10 years since I've been listening to, uh, you know, to your music and you've always been that guy that's really kind of a, a tough guy to kind of pin down. I didn't know what you were going to be like, you know, even talking to you, but you seem to be a pretty like humble, easy to know dude. Does that make sense? I guess so. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thanks for mm -hmm. not, thanks for not being the, the other guy. Could have gone, <laughs> could have gone so many ways. You know? Thanks so much for talking to me today. Thanks a lot. <laughs>